What is going on, everybody? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And that's right. I know you can't believe it. Neither can I. He survived the man himself, uh, Captain Cough today, Kyle Filio Filson. Freedom. What's going on, Brad? How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm back at Skeleton <laughs> Studios, back from the hospital. Uh, I'm still sick. I still have pneumonia, but I'm much better than I was two weeks ago. Uh, <clears throat> if you hear me clearing my throat or sound raspy, um, that's why I have uh, uh, double pneumonia and I also had a blood infection. <laughs> uh, I have no idea where I caught any of this. I was... Uh, you hadn't been living that clean life. That's the <clears throat> problem. <clears throat> I had been uh, working like normal. Uh, nothing was amiss. Uh, it was a Tuesday. I don't know the exact date. I'd have to look at the calendar. Um, I had worked all day like normal. Uh, I'd come to Skeleton Studios after work to record uh, that week's episode, uh, which we did record. I had no problem. Uh, <clears throat> that episode never came out. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> He's losing it again. Sorry, I wasn't able to... Uh, He's crying, folks. <laughs> ...record my segment. I, uh, Tuesday night after we recorded, I went home, and about uh, 10 o'clock or so that evening, I started feeling real cold. Like, I was getting chills. and you know, Colder asked, than normal. Yeah, I asked my wife, I was like, is it cold in here? And she's like, no, you're crazy. Um, <clears throat> normally, we keep it about 70 degrees in our house. Uh, not too cold, you know, not too warm, just perfect. But I just kept getting colder, and, and her and all the kids went to bed, and uh, I was watching things uh, on YouTube. I don't remember what I was doing. I was on the computer messing around, which is typical. I do a lot of research and stuff for the show after everyone goes to sleep uh, because I'm, I'm not as distracted. Anyways, I just kept getting colder, and so I, uh, I put some wind pants on. I put a hoodie on, socks and everything. I tried to dress warm, and about midnight, I went to bed, <clears throat> and I was really freezing at this point, so I was bundled up. So I was... Completely covered in a hoodie, wind pants and everything, and was under like three or four blankets. And I mean, I was just shaking, like the chills. So fast forward about 45 minutes later, I started feeling sick to my stomach. So I went and got up and went to the bathroom, threw up. <clears throat> so immediately I thought, oh, crap, I've got the flu, you know, that's going around all the kids at school. Uh, my kids haven't gotten sick yet, but lots of people have. So, And it's flu season. I figured that's what it was. I got the flu. So I chugged a bunch of NyQuil passed out, woke up in the morning. Uh, I still felt pretty lousy, but the one thing I noticed was my, the, my back was really killing me. And, uh, I thought I had like pulled a rib when I was throwing up, you know, I've done that before. So that's originally what I thought it was. So I loaded back up on like day quill and stuff and just, I took the day off, uh, basically slept most of Wednesday, but my back just kept getting worse and worse. And of course, you know, being a guy, I'm going to tough it out. You know, it's not a big deal. I'll be okay. Stop being a wuss. Uh, it'll pass. Um, so the kids came home from school. We had dinner, you know, bathed everybody. Typical evening. Uh, and then again, about 1030, it was time to go to bed. And uh, and my back was really killing me. So I tried to lay down. And it was just really painful. Like I couldn't lay down. I couldn't sit up. It was uh, laborious to breathe. And even my wife had asked, like, man, are you wheezing? You know, like, are you doing that on purpose? Or, And I was like, no, I just, and every time I breathe, it really hurts my back. You know, again, I thought it was a pulled rib. She had went to bed, and I had sat up watching TV because I couldn't really sleep. And about 1230, I knew something was wrong. So I, I went, and I woke her up, and I said, hey, look, you're going to have to take me to the emergency room. Something's not right. It's not a rib. I was, you know, I was pressing on my ribs. It wasn't hurting. This felt something something different, something internal. Now, mind you, my father and my little brother both have had their appendix removed, which is on the right side. So immediately I thought, well, I wonder if it's my appendix. Or I thought it was maybe a kidney stone, because you told me about your, your experience passing one of those, mm -hmm. uh, or my gallbladder, something. I knew something wasn't right. So my wife, she called my mother. My mother only lives, I don't know, seven miles from my house, not too far away. If she could come over and... uh you know, watch the kids while she took me to the uh, emergency room. So that's what happened. My mother came over. My wife took me to the emergency room, went to the emergency room, you know, the typical stuff. There was no one there, luckily. So I went right in, you know, they weigh you, they ask you what's wrong. And they did a, uh, a chest x-ray. 
it came back in like three minutes. And they're like, you got pneumonia. I was like, pneumonia? <laughs> I mean, mind you, I, I wasn't coughing. We had just spent a week hiking <clears throat> through the mountains and there was no issue, aside from us being old, but I mean, no issue absolutely health-wise whatsoever. With heavy packs, high yeah. elevation, I mean- like nothing. That was it. Was it wasn't a problem? Um, so I was like pneumonia. I haven't even been coughing. And they said, "Well, you don't have to cough to necessarily to catch pneumonia." And they're like, "You need to get to the emergency. Uh, I mean, you need to go to the hospital." I was like, "Oh, great." <laughs> Thought they were joking. No, they weren't joking. They put an IV in me. Uh, they started getting, putting fluids in me, and then I had to ride in an ambulance. You know, not with the flights flashing, nothing like that, but. Uh, over to Harris Hospital in, in Fort Worth, where they checked me in, and uh, same kind of thing. They did some x-rays. Turned out I had, because when I was in the emergency room, they only x-rayed the side that I was feeling pain on, my right side. Mm -hmm. When I got to the hospital, they x-rayed my whole chest and said, no, you got double pneumonia. And then, of course, you know, they started doing all the tests, drawing blood and things. And they're like, not just that, you have a, you have a blood infection. Like Streptococcus a, a. Yeah, like a, a type of strep, kind of like strep throat, but... I guess it's a type of bacteria similar to that. And they were like, no, that's pretty serious. <laughs> like they're like, they were saying that it's a very aggressive and that um, they've seen diabetics and stuff lose their legs and stuff to it. And uh, my brother told me that he has, my brother's the firefighter, that they had a guy that worked with him uh, that had the same thing and, and tried to tough it out. And uh, in like 12 days, he was dead. Yeah. Anyway, so <clears throat> luckily it was pretty early. They caught everything. They put me on a ton of different uh, antibiotics, and uh, they uh, took a giant syringe. I don't remember what the procedure's called, but they went in through my back, were able to drain my lungs, and uh, you know, and I was in the hospital for eight days. Uh, it was, you know, terrible, like you would expect. Punishment. The nurses, you know, they come and uh, check your vitals like every four hours, and on top of that, because of the blood infection, uh, they were drawing blood two to three times a day. Uh, but when it comes to needles and giving blood and stuff, it, it, it doesn't bother me. It's not painful. I just can't look at it. So as long as I look away, I'm good. Like I can't watch it happen, but as long, um, you know, but it, it becomes annoying. And right? you can't rest. And you can't rest. The, the bed was terrible. The room's terrible. The environment's terrible. I don't like, I've never been to the hospital, uh, since I was born. I've always been a very healthy person. Luckily, uh, I've always had really good health. Uh, <clears throat> I take that back. I might have went to the emergency room when I broke my arm one time, but I, I never stayed at the hospital. This yeah. is my first stay at the hospital. Other than stitches or getting bones set, it's about that's the only yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, I'm just in and out. Very healthy. Uh, even like when it comes to dentistry, I don't have a single filling. I don't have any cavities. Like I've always been pretty good. Luckily, I don't know how I escaped by. Uh, but what was shocking is they were you know checking all my organs. So not only did I have like CT scans, CAT scans. You've got to tell them that because uh, I <clears> dropped by to see him Sunday on my way back to New Orleans. And he, him yeah, telling tell me this story's the best. <laughs> so not only did they do CT scans, CAT scans, things like that, they also did ultrasounds. You know, they wanted to make sure there was no blood clots or anything like, you know, typical crap. Uh, and then they said, we're going to, you know, first thing that stood out to me, I was shocked that I didn't have high blood pressure. Because you guys have all heard me go on my rants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just always assumed I probably had high blood pressure. Once again, I never go to the doctor unless I have a problem. You know, unless there's a bone sticking out, blood shooting out, or I feel like something's really wrong failure. with one of my organs. <laughs> yeah, I usually don't go to the doctor. So <clears throat> something I probably needed to have checked for a while, just never did. So that was number one, that I didn't have high blood pressure. Number two, they were going to check out all my organs. So that was the scary moment. Kind of like when you first get your very first like AIDS test or, you know, when you're trying to, you know, when you're applying for health insurance, uh, not health insurance, but like a life insurance policy or uh, checking for any communicable diseases, you know, chlamydia, Your whatever. choices start running through your mind. Right. So you start <laughs> like, oh no. So instantly <clears throat> I've lived a, a, a pretty uh, hard life. I would say, I, you know, I like to have a drink or two. I, you know, I got piss poor liver tobacco function <laughs> as well as other things throughout my life. And, uh, so I figured, you know, certainly there's going to be some issues with my organs. I'm expecting that when they came back, I had a completely clean bill of health. They said, no, all your organs look great. Kidneys look fine. <laughs> liver looks fine. Stomach looks it. fine. Everything looks fine except for your lungs. So I was like, are you sure? You know, I thought maybe they had messed up the, the switched my uh, <laughs> yeah, right. profile to someone else, you know, but now apparently I'm, I was really healthy. They were commenting on that. They were glad that I was in good shape. 
uh, you know, they asked me what I did, you know, for a living, of course. And I told them about being in radio and as well as <clears throat> my real estate job. Uh, but I told them, you know, I was pretty active. I, I, I participate with my boys' baseball team. Uh, I told them about, you know, hunting. We do what we just got back from? <laughs> backcountry hunting where we do a lot of hiking and things like that. And thank God I, I'm into all that because I could only imagine if I was like super unhealthy, like 60, 70 pounds overweight or something. Because I'm telling you, here I am two weeks out. And it's hard to breathe. Well, and he's also on the double pneumonia diet, too. You've dropped now probably pushing 20 pounds. Yeah, I lost a lot of weight. Because, man, dude, I tell you, I couldn't hardly eat. First of all, the hospital food's terrible. Number two, I just didn't really have much of an appetite. So I was literally I think, eating like fruit. Because I think I'm like, antibiotics does that to you, doesn't it? I, I, man, Make I don't it know. just where you're not hungry. I just didn't feel very hungry. So when I did eat, I would eat like a cup of fruit, applesauce. I'm like, look. You're not really cooking fruit. You're just cutting it up. So you can't really mess that up right? <laughs> yeah. versus some of the other mystery meat and things that were in there. Like I thought y'all wanted me to be healthy and this is what you're bringing in here. <laughs> yeah. So first and foremost, uh, I want to thank everybody for all the warm messages that were sent to me, whether it was on Facebook, Instagram, whatever social media, direct emails, wh wherever. I, I, I don't, didn't have a chance to read them all, but I appreciate it. I didn't know I was liked. You wouldn't believe all the people I know that were calling and, and calling my wife, checking on me. Uh, because I was like, well, none of these people contact me in my day-to-day -day life. Like, I never hear from y'all. The moment I'm dying. It's because you're never unhealthy. We just established yeah, that. Yeah, it's like one of those guys who's like a terrible husband who's like beats the kids and cheats on them. Then he dies, and all of a sudden he's a saint. <laughs> right? You, ever, you know those the stories. Here's the thing. They weren't checking on you. They just wanted to talk to your uh, wife. Yeah. That's They're just letting them know, hey, I'm here for you whenever, whenever Kyle dies. Yeah. I'm here for you, honey. <laughs> so... It was a scary moment, and it's definitely uh, made me rethink um, my life going forward. You know, you always why kinda, you're healthy. You come out of it on end, so you don't need to rethink anything. You just keep living the life you're living, right? Just, There's no uh, change. Yeah, well, apparently, I, I mean, you are as healthy as can be. Yeah, but I aside from this lung deal, so there's no change. I don't. I, I somehow have, have skinned by. <laughs> I think I need to make a, a drastic, not drastic, but I do need to make some changes. You know, you go through your life, you always feel immortal. You gonna stop cursing day. and stop eating sugar? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not gonna. No, I'm not gonna become. So a there's square. no changes, folks. Just so y'all know, there's no small changes. changes coming. Small changes. I'm gonna try to eat a little better. Uh, probably lay off the booze a little more. 180 days, folks. This lasts 180 days. That's, that's yeah. That's definitely possible. <laughs> definitely possible. But I've been wanting to podcast. It was the longest break I've had since we started the show almost seven years ago. But uh, I just didn't have the lungs for it. Like uh. People, when they come see me, they're like, man, you're just not very talkative. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you. I can't. It's hard. You know, or people want to come cheer me up and make me laugh. And I'm like, that was like the last thing I need because short of breath. And that was, that was one of the things. I've never really had much anxiety. But man, I'm telling you, when you can't breathe, it's like being claustrophobic almost. Like it kind of freaks me out. Because I can it's imagine. Like, it's like, man. It, when you're it trying to much, lay down and physically you can't draw br a breath it's in. It's much better now. So like now my oxygen level is like 97%. But when I went to the hospital, it was 70. Yeah. And uh, it's very hard to breathe. And, you know, everybody's jogged too much or swam too hard and you get out of breath. But now just imagine that feeling like that for days and days. Mm -mm. Like it starts kind of freaky, especially at yeah. night when it's time to lay down. Anyways, I'm back. I'm feeling much better. Uh, it's going to be a couple of weeks before I'm a hundred percent, but I'm good enough to work and do the show again. So uh, here I am. Like I said, if my voice sounds off, if you hear me wheezing a little bit, uh, that's what it's from. I was in New Orleans when mm -hmm. I got the text message that morning that you were in the hospital. I get a picture from your wife of you in a hospital bed. <laughs> and the first thing I thought of was that you got hit in, a, in the car going to work. Mm -hmm. Like he was driving on my like, great. He was in an automobile accident. And I'm like, if he's in the hospital... This is bad, bad. Like, it's a bad wreck. And then she sent some stuff, and I was like, oh, hell. So that's when my wife called your wife, and then the whole thing done. So when we came back from New Orleans, we went straight. My Well, my daughter and I, because my wife was, of course, on the cruise ship. We went straight to his hospital room and hung out there for a little bit. But it's that thing is, yeah, like I was talking to him, and all I could – he would he would answer a little, but it was mainly nods, <laughs> yes or no's, because he just can't. Now, we would talk a lot – on text, yeah, because it's no big deal. You just text and go on. But it's one of those things. Like for the longest time, 
we couldn't because I knew you couldn't breathe. So we weren't asking a lot of questions. I was just telling you stuff that was going on. But I knew you were getting crazy. Even after they sent you home, you were getting stir crazy around the house. That's you're just like it's like you're on lockdown. You can't do anything. That's been one of the hardest parts is I uh, I very rarely watch TV. Um, when I do watch it, it, I usually watch like a, I watch movies or a series with a purpose. <clears throat> yeah, or like a, a series, not just to, to take up your day. But I don't just like watch television, right? So I'm always on the move. Whether it's taking the kids here and there, uh, the multiple sports they play, whether it's the podcast, whether it's my own, I mean, you know, there's just always things to do. So after I was released from the hospital, sitting at the house, like pretty much doing nothing, it drove me crazy. Like I only could take it for about three or four days, and then I started already. You need to share the one mistake you made. <clears throat> What's that? Whenever you decided to get a driver to take you one day to work. <laughs> no, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> Only because it'll offend the person, and uh, so that probably wouldn't be the best. But it's move. the one person's my favorite. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> and I'm gonna go pick that person up and take him with me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but we got uh, him back. He's look, your color's finally good too, man. We've been keeping an eye on that, and it took. Mm. It's what's weird is how fast it crept up on me. Well, and not just that, how fast it, it your. Like we always talk about this when you're trying to get in shape and you're going to the gym or you're just doing anything, it feels like it's a slow process, but you can lose it so quickly, man. And, and when you can see the color, like when we stopped by and saw you Sunday, then we come by your house and saw you, I could see the progression, but it's man, you can just tell when you look, you're like, dude, he does not look like he still feels worth a damn. But today you actually look like yeah. yourself again. Like it's like, okay. It's getting there. We're crawling out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely feeling much better. But yeah, it, it was a scary moment because like you were saying, I was feeling good. I was normal. I mean, we were planning a snowboarding trip with the boys, mm -hmm. everything. And then literally like three days later, I'm like on. Well, you I'm left the, the studio. Bed. I was there when you left the studio, still fiddling around. You left. You felt great. We had recorded. We were laughing. We were talking about all kinds of stuff. You felt great. You're like, all right, I'm going to get out of here. I'll holler at you tomorrow. And then I had texted you the next day because you were still at home and I was making fun of you for not going to work early that morning. Yeah. I'm that's like, right. what are you doing? And then it went by for hours. I didn't get an, an answer. And I'm like, man, that's weird. And then all I get back is I've got the coronavirus. It's what it that's, got across. That's, that's another thing that I thought of. And then, boy, they did they ask me. I mean, that yeah. was some of the things they were asking when I first they got there. They ran you through the ringer on Have that. Have you been out of the country? You Have know, you been to College Station? Been to College Station. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, somebody down there caught it. Yeah, that's it another thing. I mean, now there's like eight people in Texas. I think that have it. stop. Listen, China. Uh, Here we go, folks. I appreciate you listening to the show, but if you have a, a plague, they should stop every plane from China coming here temporarily, yeah, and nobody forever. go there. Yeah, not if you forever. go there, you just know you're not coming back. <laughs> you're gonna have to. You got. You're gonna have to wait this one out, dude. I'm telling you. Yeah, we don't need that. We don't need to help the virus spread from continent to continent. Can we please yeah, do away with the planes coming to China? Uh, no offense to Chinese people. I love Chinese food. Are you crazy? <laughs> but I just, I don't want any of that. I don't need that Nobody virus. Nobody needs a coronavirus. No. no I don't no. need any of that going on. But yeah, I'm glad you're back. It makes, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was a little worried. Uh, I was really worried, but I wasn't going to tell you uh, after we left the, the hospital. Yeah. Because, well, first of all, we get there. There's a little thing he left out. When they had him on oxygen, they can't put like the, the humidifier or the bubbler or whatever in that line because of the moisture in his lungs. So he has to have oxygen. Well, that stuff dries you out. So all of his sinuses and lungs are dry. So he's coughing so much. He's coughing up blood yeah. every time. And so like he's sitting beside me, him and I are actually sitting in the chairs in the room and I'm talking to him, telling him what I had experienced in New Orleans. And he's coughing up where he looks like uh, Val Kilmer's character on Tombstone, Doc Holliday, yeah, yeah, is what exactly he's right. doing, coughing up. And I'm like, dude, this is not, we left out of there. And my daughter, Michaela, was like, are you okay? I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not really okay. I don't like seeing him like this, man. <laughs> I'm like, this ain't good. Between you and then when Monty was in there so long when he almost bled to death, I'm like, <clears throat> can't lose my buddies out here whenever they're dying. I guess I'm next. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they definitely took a lot of blood and me coughing it up. I probably lost... I don't know. Enough. Two liters. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Two liters. Yeah. I mean, they were, it, it was uh, pretty rigorous. But anyways. You're good to go. I know people are bored. They're tired of hearing about it. They're like, who cares? We want to hear about the paranormal. If you drop dead, Cam will just get another co-host. <laughs> All of that's true. Um, uh, maybe 
Maybe it would have been better off if I had just passed away. I'll keep his corpse in here while I record for yeah, a like while. like weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. Like just get me taxidermy. Till he goes to stinking, and then I'll get rid of him. <laughs> uh, just get me preserved. No. Get a no. wax figure. Right. I'll have your urn sitting on the desk. That's what I'll do with it. I'll just keep you in here and a bunch of ash. We'll make you into clay, and I'll make you into like a, a coffee mug that I can drink coffee out of. Right. Mix your ashes in clay and make coffee mugs. Well, while we're going to – let's kick it off. While we're going, I got something for you all. This comes from Kyle's favorite website, Cryptozoology News, folks. Uh, of course, when I get done telling you all this, at the end of this, this episode, I'm going to have to uh, – Tell you what happened to my daughter and I a weekend uh, a week ago. Uh, I actually, and I told Kyle the minute it happened, and I still don't really know what to think about it. I actually had an experience. I had something strange happen to my daughter and I, and she's the one that first saw it and pointed it out to me, and we still don't know. And Kyle and I have discussed it, and I still have no idea, and I'll run it past y'all when this is over. But anyhow, there's a North Carolina couple that say is that they came upon what they described as a huge Bigfoot filly. Oh, yeah? Denise Galindo was talking to the BFRO, and she was telling them that back in Swain County, there in North Carolina, at dusk, that her and her husband saw an unidentified primate a few days ago. Now, this is what she was quoted saying. There was a very strange-looking, what I thought was an odd-looking man, and as we passed it, I said to my husband, that's a strange-looking person. And as I looked in the rearview mirror, it stood up on the road and was watching us driving away, and it was at that point when I realized what it really was. Now, she said that her husband wanted to turn around and go back to investigate. So she says, as we approached the area, we saw it on the side of the road watching us, and it was massive. My husband got out of the car to take a better look, and we were about 100 yards away, and nothing was obstructing our view. So I yelled at my husband to get back into the car, and I managed to turn my Jeep around, and I got the heck out of there. Now, what she describes that they saw was a humanoid covered in long black hair that she estimates was seven to eight feet tall. Now, they actually got to speak to the BFRO investigator, Matt Moneymaker. Mm, okay. And he says that, hey, look, I talked to him. These eyewitnesses seem very credible and that this report, he believes, is 100% legit. And I said that there's no explanation as to why the people that reported the sighting didn't provide photographic evidence. They didn't say it. They never brought it up. Now, Matt says this is kind of strange because they had the time to go back and see the creature a second time. But it may be one of those deals. Well, I'll know this from what I just saw. I'm taking a picture never crossed my mind. It was never like I need to take a photograph of this. Right. You know, and this whole thing. So, no, back in the Carolinas, there's a giant humanoid running around out there covered in black fur. So y'all be careful, especially driving your Jeep. First of all, hats off to the guy that wants to go back and check it out. Right, yeah. He's like, I got this. Let's go see what's going down. There's two types of people. What does the new commercial say? There's two types of people. You either run with Sasquatch or you run from Sasquatch. <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of those new Jack Lee's yeah, commercials. I like that. It's, it's the same way in the Sasquatch community. People either are terrified or they're exhilarated and want to know more but speaking of bigfoot check this out this was sent into lon strickler over at phantoms of monsters by a fellow named hh and it's about a bigfoot encounter that happened right here in the great state of texas it says i was born and raised in a little town west of paris texas in lamar county while i was growing up i had heard of bigfoot it wasn't something i spent much time thinking about but i would watch the occasional documentaries along with my two brothers i guess it didn't actually consider it real I'd never seen one, and I didn't know anyone who had. So for me, I never thought it was real. It was summer, and my brothers and I were out of school. Just as we did as we did every year, we were spending as much time as we could out at the lake. We had a trail behind our house that went straight through the woods to the local lake. The trail was about a mile long. But when you're a kid, it doesn't matter how far you have to walk, as long as you got to go swimming with your friends and buddies. My brothers and I were both good swimmers, so my mom didn't worry about us too much. Occasionally, she would drive over to the lake to check on us, but most of the time we were on our own. We would get there after our chores were done and stay just about till dark. Sometimes, she would let my brothers and I pitch a tent with some of their friends and spend the night at the lake by ourselves. Now, I was never allowed to do this because I was a girl, but that was okay with me. Mom and Dad would pitch a tent in the backyard for me and my friends. It was on a Friday, 
and my brothers and I were setting up their tent by the lake. My friends and I had been swimming most of the day when my mom came by with a late lunch for us. She had picked up some burgers from a local fast food place. I didn't really want anything, so I had my soda while the boys ate their burgers. Afterwards, I was right back in the water. Mom yelled at me after that to start home before it was dark. I had walked home plenty of times without my brothers, so tonight wouldn't be any different. The sun was starting to sink low in the sky, and most of my friends had already left for the day. I knew I should be heading home too, but I chose to stay just a few more minutes and help my brothers gather some firewood. I grabbed the bag that contained my uneaten cheeseburger and headed for the path in the woods. As I walked, I began to feel more and more uneasy. I kept telling myself that there was no reason to feel this way. I'd walked through here many times, a lot of them were alone and after dark. I had gone about a quarter of the way when I heard some short snorting sound that I wasn't familiar with. I stopped to listen. I knew that it wasn't a deer. I stood there silently, but the woods were quiet. Actually, they were a bit too quiet. Usually there was the sound of frogs and crickets with it being this close to the water, but tonight they weren't making any sounds. I started to walk again, but this time a little faster. I kept scolding myself for being afraid. This time, as I walked, I heard a deep grunt. It stopped me dead in my tracks. There was something in the woods with me. I had no clue what it was out here with me, but I knew this wasn't normal. I kept hearing my mom's words, get home before it gets dark. Now I was really wishing I had listened. As I began to walk through, I thought I could hear footsteps. The steps seemed to be matched up with my own. I needed to stop and listen, but to stop walking was the last thing I wanted to do. I finally took a deep breath and I stopped. I heard it. Three more steps right after mine. I was sure of it. Someone was in the woods with me. Had someone been watching us at the lake today? I was absolutely terrified. It was all I could do to keep myself from breaking into a full run. And for a split second, I thought about going back, but I was now halfway. So it would be best just to keep heading home. Then I wondered if anyone would hear me if I screamed. I heard a low grunt and I started walking again. I needed to get closer to home. If I got closer to the house, they may hear me if I started screaming. I pictured my mom in the kitchen cooking dinner with her radio tuned to a country station and her singing along. Dad would be in the living room with the news on. The central air would be whirling along. and They probably would not hear me no matter how loud I screamed. I continued my fast walk with heart beating in my ears. My sweaty hand clutched the bag tightly that contained my uneaten lunch. I had forgotten all about it until I felt a cramp in my fingers. The footsteps began again just as I started to walk. They didn't sound exactly the same as they had before. I was straining my ears trying to find out why they sounded so differently. When I realized what it was, my heart froze with complete terror. Those footsteps were now behind me on the trail. I stopped and spun around before thinking. There behind me was something nightmares are made of. About 15 feet away from me was this creature that had stopped too. It stood there in the middle of the dark trail looking at me. I couldn't make out much detail because it was dark. So I assumed the hair was black. It looked to be about eight foot tall and about four feet from shoulder to shoulder. Out of reflex, I let out an involuntary scream. When I screamed, this thing tilted its head to the side, much like a dog will do when it hears something it doesn't understand. I began to slowly back away from it. Just a few steps, it let out a grunt that sounded like a huge ape. It was a deep, throaty sound. It took a step toward me, and I let out another scream and threw the bag at it. I turned and ran for home as hard as I could. It didn't slow down until I reached the back porch. When I went inside, it was pretty much like I had described. There was no way they would have ever heard me screaming. I went to my bedroom, sat down on the bed. My mind was still trying to sort out what had just happened. What had I seen? Just thinking about it again gives me the creeps. I would never be able to walk those woods in the dark again. I may not be able to walk them in daylight. Where this had happened, 
Where did this thing come from? Has it always lived there? I had so many questions. I wanted to talk to my brothers about it, but I knew they would never believe me and would tease me relentlessly. I fell asleep that night thinking about the way it had tilted its head whenever I screamed. The next morning, I waited around the house until my mom drove into town and I got her to drop me off at the lake. My brothers were getting ready to go swimming. They both asked what had happened to me last night. I didn't know why they were asking me this, and I was curious as to how much they knew, so I responded, nothing, why? Then they proceeded to tell me that one of them got hit with my fast food bag last night while sitting by the fire. Now, naturally, they assumed it was me teasing them, and the other one kept hearing me scream really late last night. Now, how could they have heard me scream late at night when I made it home pretty early? I knew I couldn't tell them what happened, but I really wanted to. They said their friends told them that the screams were coming from a Bigfoot. A few of them got scared and went home. I laughed right along with my brothers. How silly to think there was a Bigfoot in these woods. H.H. Wow. So first off, it was a woman. I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought it was a male. Uh, but how terrifying is that? Uh, kids, you know, hiking through the woods to go swim at this lake, like, you know, typical kid stuff in the summer. And uh, something was following her through the woods. And her brothers and their friends heard screaming. They thought it was the sister, but it probably was not. Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. <clears throat> Another like comment. That doesn't, like, like that doesn't cross my mind every time we're out doing stuff anyway. I think about it. <laughs> every time, man. Um, I can't help it. You know, sometimes when you're out hunting or in the woods, it becomes eerily quiet. I mean, and that and that's what so many of these encounters, whether it's with Sasquatch, Duendies, Fey Folk, whatever, mm -hmm. um, the woods suddenly become quiet. I don't know. Um, these stories, these these eyewitness accounts of Sasquatch, much like the one you talked about, mm -hmm. and so many people write in. Um, if real, man, that it's terrifying. Like we've talked about so many times. I'm on both sides of the fence. There's days, and I think it's absolutely real, and there's other days I'm like, it can't be, but... I want it to be real so bad. I do too. I want it to be real, yet I don't want it found. And that's me, like we've said before. And like, it, I may have I know changed, that sounds crazy. I've changed my mind, I think, a little bit more after having this weirdness happen. Before we get into that, let, let me read this to you. Look, there's... I know y'all like these, what's... Not really time slips as much as glitches in the matrix, that these things go on and Lon's lucky enough. He shared a few with us. Now we've gotten some good ones from listeners that have sent some in that are, that are odd that it's almost like somebody pressed pause in the game and they could still drive around, you know, stuff uh -huh. like that. That's what one of these kinds of sounds like. Let me, let me read this to you. This is, this is very, very interesting. Comes from a person with the uh, initials. Let's see, where was it? With TH instead of HH. I got TH here. Okay. TH writes help. Okay, so about two hours ago, me and my fiancé went to go get some food. We got on the freeway and had about a four-minute drive until our exit. Now, the place we went to eat somewhere that we frequent often. So we get off on our exit and we make a left turn. Now, the direction is very important. We make a left turn and continue to go straight on that or after that. Now, we drove for about five minutes and then suddenly realized that there was no other traffic on the road going in either direction. Now, I live in Fresno, California, and although it's not L.A. or San Francisco, we're still a big city, and there's always some kind of traffic. Now, it wasn't too late. It's about 11.45 p.m., so not only is there no traffic, but there is nobody, she writes in all caps, nobody around and all the streetlights were out. Now, my fiancé made a comment on this, and we both got a little freaked out but shrugged it off. We then realized that we were going the opposite direction of what we had thought, as if we had turned right and not left like we are sure that we did. We'd been driving for over 10 minutes by that point, and our destination, once off the freeway, is at most three minutes away. We were at least five miles away from our destination in the complete opposite direction. There was also a very heavy feeling of being the only people in the entire town. It felt like all the people in town were just gone. Now, we're sure that we turned the right way, and even if we hadn't, we can't explain the disappearance of people or traffic 
or the heavy, creepy feeling that we got, or the fact that even if we had turned the wrong way, it took way longer to get to the point we were at than it should have. Now, once we realized all this and that we were going the wrong way, we turned around, and all of a sudden, everything was back to normal. Street lights are back on, there's traffic and people on the street, so we start freaking out, trying to figure out what just happened to us. So we go home. And I start to tell my teenage son what had happened. And it was at this point, my iPad turns itself on and Siri asks if she can help me. Now, anyone with Apple products know that in order to get Siri to work, you have to hold the home button down. So now we're all freaking out over that. Then about 15 minutes later, the hallway light that my fiance is 100% sure that he turned off came back on. We don't know what's going on, and we're kind of freaked out. If anyone out there can help explain it. Hmm. So it when they were talking about driving down the street, the first thing I could think of is, imagine a stack of papers, right? Yeah. Or like a book. You've opened a book to a certain page, but you can slip a bookmark in between any of those pages, whether you're reading it or not, okay? Right. Imagine if you had made the turn, and in your matrix, you're supposed to go down one path, but the page gets turned and you get in between a couple of pages so you don't see the people. It's kind of being like behind the scenes. Right. And you have to turn around. And when you turn around, you make your way back in to the actual scene that you're supposed to be in because that's what it sounds like. But how did they go? They know they turned left. You have to imagine this. And everybody listening to my voice has places that they go with friends or family or by themselves that you go enough times that you could literally find it probably with your eyes closed and somebody else driving and you could tell them. So I'm thinking you, you don't make that mistake and go the opposite direction. No. You instantly catch yourself doing things like that. If you're in a strange place, maybe, but not in your own town and not something that you frequent, it's right. not going to happen yet. That's what happened to them. They turned one way and it ended up being the wrong way that, and they were used to going it. So it's, that's an insane, insane story. Now here's another one. EZ. Now I like EZ here. EZ writes, I was getting groceries with this girl and we left in different cars. I pulled out and left before she had shut the trunk and got in. So I drove fast most of the way home, but I took a different route, just one street over and it had no lights. Now this sounds like me and my wife. Well, you know, you always, you always want to beat your family home. Like with you both take two cars, you want to sure. be the cool one, right? Sure. Easy writes, somehow she was at my house unloading with her child already out, and I was blown away. I didn't stop but three or so times to turn, and she drove the main street with five stoplights. I have never known her to drive fast or as fast as I was driving. She would have had to been going 100 miles an hour down the street, not hitting lights to even catch me. And it wasn't important. It was just normal stuff, and she wouldn't risk her child for that but it made my blood blood run cold when she looked at me. So it's like she's like that. And that's where he leaves it. Easy leaves it. Mm. There is the fact that she went straight home. It's like he got stuck in a time loop before he could break out of it. He left while she's still putting groceries up. Yeah. And beats her home. I don't know. I'm not sure if this is paranormal though. It could be an extremely, uh, helpful swing of luck that she hit all green lights. Maybe it's possible. All that's green lights. Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You definitely notice it when you hit all red lights. That's for sure. I have had it when I have left my house and hit every green light till I get to work. And it takes like just a few minutes for me to get to my office. Then I've had it where I've hit every red light. And then you realize like it stacks the time on. It's, so it, if she hit every red light, there's a really good chance that there's green light, nothing. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes. Rather every green light. There's a really good chance there's nothing crazy went on here. It was. It is funny. That if you take like a main thoroughfare, lots of times it's way faster, especially when the lights are green, to get where you're going. Yeah, I do that all the time for work. Like you'll put in a destination and uh, <clears throat> Google will give you a couple of options. Yeah. I always choose the I always choose the scenic route. Like it, it doesn't bother me if it's 10 minutes slower. I prefer like country roads versus uh, tollways. Oh, it's that's just, me. Yeah. Nothing drives me even more crazy than like the express lanes that you have to pay a toll for. Mm-hmm. And there'll still be people on there going like 10 below the speed limit. You're like, this is the expressway. You We're paid paying to go money. fast. If you don't want to go fast, don't get on the expressway. Yeah. Move over. Drives me nuts. So well, let's take a break, folks. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about an unusual murder known as Septic Tank Sam. You stick with us, folks. You're listening 
to Expanded Perspectives. People tend to romanticize small towns. They think that just because a small town is in a big city, that nothing bad ever happens there, and that it's a safe community that's perfect for raising children. And, most of the time, this is true. But some tiny towns are very dangerous and hide their own secrets. Cam and I both live and grew up in a small rural town in Texas, just outside of Dallas-Fort Worth, which is where we are broadcasting from to this day. The truth is that small towns have dangers all their own. Sure, there might be plenty of white picket fences, farmer's markets, churches and parks, but that doesn't mean a small town doesn't have its own dark underbelly. In the small Canadian town of Tofield, just 68 miles southeast of Edmonton, the residents know this all too well. Their town might be small, but they still remember a murder that shook them to their very core. You see, just before Wayne Gretzky, Yari Curry, and Messier were about to start their hockey dynasty in Edmonton, there was an unknown body found tossed into a rural septic tank, abandoned there alone, with no name and no idea how they got there. It all started on a warm spring day back in April 1977, on a farm owned by a Mr. and Mrs. McLeod. On the property was an old abandoned farmhouse, an old barn, a well house, an attack room. On this particular day, the 13th of April, to be exact, Mr. McLeod was out on the property with his wife, looking through the old septic tank that sat there, rusting away beyond the trees in order to salvage an old pump that was no longer being used. Once the septic tank had been reached and opened, the family immediately knew something was wrong. Floating atop the murky water was a gray sock. How on earth could that have gotten there? Not long after questioning the first discovery, they soon realized that the sock was still attached to a human leg. Instead of finding the pump, what they found instead was a macabre sight that would shock them to their very core and become one of the most chilling unsolved murders in Canadian history. The family immediately called local law enforcement and an investigation was soon underway. Slowly, Bucketful after bucketful, the septic tank was drained of its putrid contents. While initially inspecting the body at the site, investigators were unable to tell how the victim had died, nor could they identify the victim's gender. It was also determined that after being dumped in the tank, quicklime was also scattered atop the corpse, with the hopes that it would quicken the decomposition process. In reality, it had just the opposite effect. The combination of quick lime and water caused the corpse to dry out and preserve itself longer than if it had been left to decompose on its own. No additional evidence was found at the abandoned house, but it was theorized whoever committed the crime had to have been a local, which would explain how the culprit or culprits knew about the secluded crime scene. The abandoned farm was well known to most in the area, and a stranger or chance encounter would not have been as likely to simply stumble upon the place. Also, in using the area, the hope was that the body would not be discovered for a very long time. Authorities were unable to determine if he was murdered at the house or if he was simply disposed of there. Once the body was brought back to the morgue, the authorities were able to finally determine that it was male, but they were unable to determine if he was murdered at the house or was simply disposed of there. Once the body was brought back to the morgue, a more thorough inspection of the, was done to the body. The body was identified, like I said, as a male with dark brown hair, he was right-handed, and was approximately 5'5 five five to 5'7 five and weighed close to 150 pounds and had a medium build. The victim was at, estimated at being within the age range of 26 to 40 years old. He was initially thought to be white, 
but later findings stated he was more likely that of a Native American descent. It was also shown that he most certainly suffered a serious illness as a child, but the illness was not disclosed. Fingerprints could not be lifted and compared due to the level of decomposition throughout the body. He still had all of his teeth, and dental work had clearly been done on him before. The body was also found to be dressed in the following. A blue Levi's work shirt, a gray undershirt, blue jeans, gray wool socks, and a brown pair of wallaby shoes. Throughout the investigation, the corpse would eventually earn the name Septic Tank Sam. It was also believed that Sam was submerged in the tank anywhere from four months to an entire year. The body had also suffered significant trauma and torture before being dumped. First, the man's hands were tied so that he would be unable to defend himself. It was noticed that the body had been burned by an intense flame, suggested to be a blowtorch. It was also believed that he was burned with lit cigarettes throughout the ordeal. The unidentified man was also severely beaten and sexually mutilated. Cut marks were noticed around the genital area. He would then be wrapped up in a yellow bedsheet, which was fastened by a length of cord. Sam was then lowered headfirst into the septic tank, but only after being shot in the head and in the chest. The police had very little to work with. The most important aspect was to identify the murder victim. So, composite sketches were drafted and distributed throughout the country. But, this yielded nothing. The next step was to distribute John Doe's dental records. The records were distributed to hundreds of dentists and featured in a number of dental magazines in the hope of putting a name to the face, but again, nothing. The case grew colder, and then cold, and stayed in nearly the exact same spot as when the body was discovered. The man with no name would be buried in Edmonton for a short while until 1979 when his body would be later exhumed. New DNA samples were taken to be stored for future testing, and multiple different measurements of the man's head were made so that a forensic pathologist could potentially rebuild the man's face. The world-renowned Dr. Clyde Snow would first recreate the skull, then he would go on to have the face built over the skull, hoping to recreate a three-dimensional composite. Just like the other leads, this too went cold. Believe it or not, Sam isn't the only person found decomposing in a septic tank. A man named Samuel Francis, a 38-year-old tattoo artist from Cape Girardeau, was last seen on December 23, 2012, when his father says he was going to meet with unidentified bikers some of whom he had problems with in the past in neighboring St. Francois County to give some of the men tattoos. The man's father, Gary Francis, told the St. Louis Post that he told Samuel and begged him not to go, not to meet up with them, but his son said that he had to. If he ran from them, they would most likely kill him. Francis's father says his son was a likable guy, but often clashed with authority. He'd been arrested a few times for various minor crimes. Francis and his father, 61-year-old Gary Francis, seemed nervous about the trip and called each other throughout the day to check in. 20 phone calls and 24 hours to be exact. On the night of his disappearance, Francis called his father one final time. He said, I'm all right. I'll call you dad in about an hour. He said on a voicemail recording that Gary Francis still saved on his phone. Now, Gary Francis never heard from his son again. Authorities searched for Francis for several months, and it's unclear what led them to the septic tank where his remains were eventually found. Initially, authorities wouldn't identify the remains of, as those of Francis. They would only say their discovery was the result of a seven-month missing person investigation. On that Friday, the medical examiner identified the remains as Francis's through his dental records. But there's more. Across the pond, the police have arrested an 86-year-old man on suspicion of murder after a woman's remains were found in a septic tank. Detectives believe the remains are those of a Brenda Venables, 
who disappeared from the village of Kempsey in Worcestershire in 1982 when she was 48. Venables was reported missing by her husband, David, who was a farmer. He told his local newspaper at the time that he had no idea what had happened to her. West Mercia police launched a murder investigation after the discovery of the remains at the couple's former home in Bestman's Lane, Kempsey, on the 12th of July. A spokesperson said detectives were awaiting DNA results, but that circumstances led them to believe that the remains were likely to be those of Brenda Venables. In May 1982, David Venables told the Worcestershire News, I just woke up to find that she had gone. She has never done anything like this before, and I haven't the faintest idea what has happened to her. He said his wife had recently been suffering from depression and a bout with the flu. Venables, who farmed 202 hectares, or 500 acres of land, added, I've been unable to sleep a wink since she left, and I can only hope and pray that she is safe somewhere. It is understood that the remains were discovered after the tank was drained during routine maintenance. Police said formal identification was likely to take a few weeks. The house on Bestman's Lane was sold in 2014, and Venables, 86 now, lives in a bungalow about a mile away. The police were carrying out searches at the bungalow. Three marked cars, including a police van, and two unmarked cars were outside the detached property. Officers were wearing gloves and could be seen inside. Police would not be drawn on activity at the scene other than to say it was a line of investigation. We will not confirm or deny the identity of the man in custody. Neighbors of Enables said he kept to himself and always had the blinds drawn at the front of his home. You can see the blinds are down, and that's all the time, and that's normal, said one woman. It's quite astounding to actually find somebody in a cesspit. A man who lives a few doors down said, We've said hello to him, but we don't know him. It's a friendly, sleepy neighborhood. The discovery was made eight miles from Pershore, where police were searching for the missing estate agent, Susie Lamplug. The search ended on July 17th, and police confirmed the Kempsey discovery was not linked to the disappearance of Lamplug from London in 1986. Flowers have been placed on the septic tank in which the remains were found. For over 40 years, the identity of septic tank Sam has baffled and frustrated authorities as well as puzzled the locals. In a town so small, someone in the community must know something, but is not willing to come forward and say what actually happened. So, who was Septic Tank Sam? What did he do to deserve this horrific fate? He must have had a family once, friends, and those who loved them. So, where are they? Who killed Septic Tank Sam? And what had he done to deserve such terrifying last moments on Earth? To end up in a half-full septic tank in the middle of nowhere? To be tortured and mutilated? This is one of the most bizarre unsolved mysteries to ever take place in North America. How many other ghastly murders or crimes have been committed in small towns all across the world where people know something but are unwilling to come forward? Reminds me of the murder of Tara Grinstead or Crystal Reisinger. In both cases, small towns hold secrets. Small towns might just be more dangerous than big ones. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Uh, an unusual murder, to say um, the least, that's, that's never been solved. They don't know who Septic Tank Sam was. Uh, they don't know why he was murdered. Uh, they don't know why he was tortured in the way he was uh, and apparently was, you know, dumped. His corpse was dumped in that septic tank, um, which the farmer and his wife just happened to find. Uh, but, you know, like I like I stated during the story, they, the the investigators think it probably was someone that was familiar with the area. They knew that that was an abandoned farm, you know, that abandoned, meaning that no one lived there. Yeah, yeah. And uh they had uh, not only did they dump the body in the in the septic tank, but they poured a bunch of lime in there, hoping to decompose the body further. But they said 
<laughs> uh, the mixture with the water actually did the opposite, preserved the body. Well, lime, they'll tell you, actually will preserve the body. The people always think it makes it eat it all up, and it doesn't. Even people, like if you just dig a, a grave and put a corpse in there and cover it in lime uh-huh. and all that stuff, it actually, it will keep the smell down, but it will not, it doesn't dissolve the body. Liquid is what dissolves flesh better than anything. So like an acid or something like yeah. that? I mean, even just water. Right. Does I mean, look at what it does. I mean, it's caught, we're, I'm not going to get into it, but to say the least, if I'm, I'm fascinated with human decomp and like cold cases and I, like, I've gotten really big into that in the last year or so. So I've been reading a lot on that. So yeah, when I die, make sure you delete my browser history. <laughs> Duck, duck, go, my friend. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm on that. I'm on that 100%. Yeah, you have to. Uh, You know what's funny, or say funny, what's really intriguing about this this case is the number of cases from that time frame out there that are completely unsolved that will probably never be solved. Yeah, and what I was shocked to find was other cases of bodies being found in septic tanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was one in England. There was another one there where the guy had a mix-up with some bikers. I never would think about dumping a body in a septic tank, but apparently people do. Well, you think how many people would look in it? Like if you knew where, well, first of all, see this, this goes down a whole nother path. If you were to go get a lot of people that live in the city and there's no knock against that, but that don't have septic tanks and have never grown up around one, they wouldn't know that there was one in the yard, even if, if there was an opening to get to it. Right. Because a lot of them have no openings to get to them. You have to dig it to find the doorway sure. in order for it to be cleaned and drained and, and do all that. And that takes years before you have to have your septic tank cleaned. Right. There's certain types that have like leach fields and yes. there's other types that are aerobic. I mean, yeah. there's different types of septic systems. So you would have you would have to be not only familiar with a septic system, but you'd have to be familiar with where that septic system, especially if it was... Now, granted, a lot of them, it's very green where the septic tank is. A lot of them set a little lower, like it looks like a small divot in the ground. So you would know where it was at. And some of them, even the older ones, didn't have but like a solid lid. They didn't have a little way, like their cleaning area might have been very small. Mm -hmm. So it would have been hard to stuff somebody in there. But all that being said, you would have to know your way around that and even know that was a thing because – Coming from town, you wouldn't notice all that. Well, that's stuff. what they think that, that whoever did this was familiar with the area because this was a farm with an abandoned. I guess there used to be a farmhouse there. It was no longer there. All that was there was like a barn, a tack room, storage shed, and there was that abandoned septic system where the farmer and his wife had come back to get the pump because they were no longer using mm-hmm. it. Somebody knew that you know no one was living there, so they knew not only that the septic system was there, but that no one was currently living there. That's why it would be a good spot to, to dump a body. Yeah. But it's never been solved. And there's, man, like I said, I've been reading a lot of cold cases. And, of course, there's still crimes today that don't get solved. But it's the mass numbers of crimes that took place, let's say, between the 30s and the 60s. Yeah, this was in the 70s, like 77. That, that is almost impossible to solve some of those. And also, too, the, the, the main thing, and I've learned this just by doing all this research into that, is forensics, they didn't have any way of other than fingerprints. So if you pulled somebody's teeth, or if let's say that they didn't even have dental records or you didn't even know who their dental their dentist was, right? Like you don't know who they are to even confirm or even get an idea. So they're missing, let's say the skin is sloughed off the fingers mm-hmm. and they don't have, you know, a facial reconstruction any way. There's no way. I mean, it's just that's just a bottle. Well, That's it. They think that Sam was, uh, what do they call them? First Nations. Oh, he okay. thinks he was, they, he would come off of a reservation, which apparently they don't keep real accurate documents as far as dental records and things like I that. I got you. Which got you. led to it even being more complicated. Well, I know that there are a lot of First Nation women in Canada that have gone missing and it's something that needs to be made more of a priority, but is not. Because I'm sure because they're First Nation women, but there are a lot of those women that are, they're just missing. And you, so you can, oh, of course, assume the worst, but that is something that. Oh, what was that? What was that, that good movie with. Uh, Cold River. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that was really good. That That's came a, out a couple years yeah. ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. Okay. We're going to shift gears. I've got to, I've got to share this. I've got to. So let me read this to you. Then I'm going to get back into what I wanted to share with y'all. This comes, Lon posted this several years ago, and it says, Hi, this is from CS. 
says, I'm from Maple Ridge, British Columbia, Canada. I was sitting in my car at Thrifty Foods late night between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. Not exactly sure of the time because it happened a few years ago. The Thrifty was open 24 hours at that point. I was just sitting back staring out the sunroof when all of a sudden I can just barely see giant wings. Literally looked like a giant bat's wings. And it just flew silently high in the sky and out of my sight. Now, it was pitch black, but I could make out these giant wings. I think the lights in the store parking lot were just making it visible. Now, when my wife came out of the store, I explained to her like what I'd seen, like pterodactyl wings. And I even said it looked like a demon's wings. But it was so dark, and I was not exactly sure what I'd seen. But whatever it was, it had bat-like wings. And they seemed bigger than any bird I have literally ever seen. And it was flying silently. Now, recently, I've been looking into other people's sightings just to think maybe somebody else had seen it. And I just wanted to think or wanted to get your opinion on what you think it was. Now, he, had, of course, like I said, sent this to Lon. Now, the reason I wanted to read that quick to y'all folks is because about a week ago uh, on a Saturday evening, uh, my son's lady friend uh, has a band and they were singing in a big we have a big of course bars and restaurants and stuff everywhere around here but they have one that had a big patio outside of it called flames and it's like a seafood grill got a bar and had a big patio area and it's not huge but it's you know relatively good sized so they had been and you know asked to come up there and play so her and the band had set up and all that and me and my daughter and and uh my son was of course there and uh my sister-in-law my brother-in-law double d he come rolling up there right you know so we're all hanging out and there's people everywhere. Like the place is packed and we're sitting there listening to music and we just wanted to get out of the house a little bit. This was the day before my wife had come back from her cruise. So we're sitting there chilling and I am facing West. Now it's dark. Now when I say it's dark this time, it's probably eight 30. I'm guessing maybe not quite that late. Yeah. Probably pretty close between eight and eight 30 at this point. And my daughter's sitting right next to me. And what it is, is on the patio, they have these big picnic tables, okay? Mm -hmm. They have a few round tables, but most of them are all big picnic tables out everywhere and all this stuff. So we're sitting there. And, of course, I don't drink, so I don't have – well, I do every now and again, but I haven't drank in months. So I don't really have anything in front. What was I have? Like a tea, I think is what I had. So I'm sitting there talking to my brother-in-law. Like I said, my daughter, Michaela's right beside me. And she just real quietly, she's looking up in the sky. Now, right next to flames is a bank. So there's a bank next door to it. And it's, of course, got the flag poles and the flags are up. And they got the lights on the uh, the flags, right? You follow right. me? Yep. I'm with you. So it's casting light. And then next to that is like a another road that cuts through back. We're in a big commercial area where we're at. So there's like businesses around us and other restaurants. And there's like a Taco Bueno down, bes- you know, like three or four buildings away. And and then across the road, there's like a Walmart. So, I mean, like there's a lot of light going on, but still you can only see so far up in the sky. And my daughter taps me and she's like, dad, what is that? And she had apparently been watching it a few seconds. And then she tells me and I look up now. It's like we've said, you're talking about in the dark, in the sky, it is extremely hard to judge size. Okay. So if I'm trying to go off what I know the height of like, say a water tower is okay. Okay. Because of that's what I have to go off of seeing them every day and working around them. And then I'm going off at, you know, at, at night, how tall it looks. I'm guessing it was between about 130 and 180 foot off the ground is what I saw. Okay. Now, there's no easy way to explain this other than what I saw looked like bat wings, but these bat wings looked bigger than the picnic table I was sitting on. And the picnic table I was sitting on was probably a 10, I think it's 10 foot long. Okay. Okay. So imagine bat the, wings. It, yeah. But it didn't move like bat wings. When I first saw it, the first thing that went through my mind was, okay, our, our bat country tarps. Uh, if you go look like on a Seek Outside. DST. The DST, yeah. You look at one of those or uh, he'll look at like any of the tarps. In any good Sil Poly lightweight camping tarp. It looked like that tan, like that coyote tan uh-huh. Sil Poly tarp or Sil, you know, whatever they're made out of. But they're like a the, the synthetic badass ultralight can't tear tarp. And uh, for those of you that, that don't 
aren't familiar with that material. It's like the ones that like a tent material, like parachute materials where right. it's made of just a little tougher. So it looked like that in a tan color. And I thought I could see, for the lack of a better way of describing, like black fingers in the tarp, like you would see the finger of bones of the bat through the membrane of the, the wing, correct? Okay, yeah, I understand. And the way it blew is it looked like a tarp blowing, like you would see a, fl- a, a popped mylar balloon blow through the air or like a, you know, when you see like that real lightweight, like trash bag material or something blow across the, the like a somebody lost it out of a construction truck and it's blowing and it looks like a funky moving sheet, almost like it's moving underwater, but it's in the air. That's what this looked like at about, like I said, uh, let's say 150 foot above us. The only reason I saw it was because the lights from the flagpoles were hitting it. Okay. As it moving, it was moving left to right. So it was moving south to north. Now, the oddest thing about it was at first, I'm like, man, how strong is the wind got to be to blow trash up that high in the air and me not feel it? And it's at this point, I look at the flagpoles and the flags are dead. They are draped against the pole itself. So there's no wind. I thought it was just because of where I was setting. Okay. Okay. So there's no wind. So I'm looking at the flagpoles. Flags are dead, hanging straight down. This thing's 150 foot in the air. And have you seen the movie with Michael Jai White called Spawn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I like that movie. All right. Me too. You know how his his uh, cape his cape works funky, the way it flies and moves? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly how this sill poly tan tarp bat wing looking thing was moving through the sky. And it moved across the sky. And it moved from south to north. So from my left to my right moving up north, and it went back towards like uh, it was going back towards uh, what am I trying to think of that's back over there? Like a Schlotsky's that's back over there, and then it keeps going its way towards like going into town. And how fast was it moving? I probably pretty good little cl- not streaking, like it didn't look like it was on a mission, like flapping its wings, right? Right, but it was moving at a rate that I could I probably watched it for five seconds before I lost being able to see it when it crossed over and was going back towards the old, uh, the old tractor supply mm-hmm. that's back up there. This means nothing to y'all, but it's, it's helping me tell Kyle the direction it was going as it moved. But what was weird, I never saw it flap wings like it was trying to stay Could in the Could it air. have been a kite? Because they make pterosaur and pterodactyl looking kites. I know you said that there was not much wind, but if you get a kite high enough, sometimes yeah, there's yeah. wind up there. I would like to say, yeah, it, well, you know what? Yeah, 100% it could have been a kite. The problem is it wasn't holding itself open. It was almost tumbling oh. in the air. That's what I was saying. Like it moved like Spawn's right. cape. Is it moved independently like it wasn't Could it have been a blast, a, like a brown plastic sack? It could have been, dude, but it would have had to have been like a 10 by 12 or like a... a I don't know, a 12 by 14, it would have had to have been a large, and it would have to be lightweight, like extremely lightweight for anything as big as what I saw to be that high in so, the air and being carried by the wind. Right. So let me ask you this. Yeah. You saw something odd. Did it look biological to you? No. It did not. It did not. That's the first thing. You know what I'm saying? Yo, I know exactly. Like a living you, animal. Well, my mind is clicking on everything that I've ever said on this show, everything I've ever read for this show. I mean, it is just racing, and I'm like, what am I looking at? I'm not going to make – I didn't tell anybody else. Just me and Michaela were the only ones that saw it. I never thought about pulling out my phone. You couldn't have seen it anyway. Right. You would, Even if you would have had some of the best filming equipment and knew it was coming, it would have been extremely hard to get any sort of reference for what it was. But as it made its way off – Another thing that went through my mind was geese. I'm like, maybe that's just a group of geese that just flew over. Okay. Right. So I'm like, maybe, but I'm like, "Mm, they're not, I don't hear the, there's no noise. There's no nothing coming from it. At the time this thing flew over, there was no music being played. They were taking a break. It was just the chatter of what's going on there. So maybe, maybe of course my hearing ain't the best. So maybe I couldn't have heard it even if it was geese. Uh, It also crossed my mind. What if it was a few buzzards? Right, like flying. Well, out that there. was the um, the explanation for some of the UFO sightings in Lubbock and out in Level Land was uh, some of the early scientists claimed that it were that it was uh, uh, not swans but cranes, sandhill cranes. It, it was the light reflecting from the city of Lubbock on the belly of cranes. That's what people were seeing, not in fact flying saucers. Hmm. Which is 
I'm not saying this is a flying saucer. I'm saying you're, yeah. you're referencing geese. But then at the same time, you said it didn't look biological. It didn't look biological. And that's what I said is I never saw the rhythm of the wings. It would be almost, there's one movement when I saw it the clearest, like a couple of seconds after I first saw it, that it looked like if it was, you have to imagine this, if the wing went to a tip like it does on a bat on the right side, okay? Uh-huh. But not that sharp, like it was still fat, like it was a fat tip that way. As that wing came down, I'm saying wing because I don't have any other way of describing it. If it was the wing, as it came down to grab the air, that wing kept curling under itself and caused whatever it was to roll and then roll into another form as it traveled across. Like it was flying like a piece of trash wood in the air, but it did not look, it didn't look like trash. It didn't look like anything except, like I said, it looked like a tan and black tarp, ultra lightweight, sill tarp flying through the air at 150 feet, just tumbling over itself. Like it didn't look of this world. It did not. Mm. It looked like it would be like something that somebody had photoshopped into a video is what it almost looked like while I'm staring at it. And the only way I saw it was because of the lights shining on those flags was reflecting off the bottom it. of it. And that's why I bring up, could it have been a buzzard? Could it have been geese? Could it have been birds? But then I'm going through my mind because I don't know, you know, I don't study buzzards. I'm assuming you see them resting on power lines all the time. You never see buzzards eating roadkill in the middle of the night. It's almost like they like to eat during the day. So I don't yeah. know that they travel like that during the night. And the same with geese. You watch guys that hunt geese and hunt ducks and hunt crane and all that. They don't hunt them like because they're not traveling a lot at night. They like to land in the water or land in a field and they stay there till daylight and then they take off. That's why you hunt them when they're coming in or coming, you know, taking off, right. landing this, that, and the other. So I don't know. I guess it could have been because I haven't looked into what what it could have been. Did it feel paranormal to you or just misidentification? Like it you felt, couldn't identify what I, it was. That's that was the thing. It didn't feel. Of course, I I wouldn't know what paranormal felt like unless it stepped up and smacked me with a bat, but. It didn't feel like anything other than what the heck is that? What am I seeing? You know, it's one of no, those. I understand. And I think that's what so many of the sightings we report on the show is, are. Is, well, and I can't, I can't, I can't sit here and tell everybody after I pass judgment on other people's stories. as like, this is what it was. I saw Batman or I saw Mothman. I'm like, no, I saw something fluttering through the air that I can't explain. And that's, right. that's all I can tell you is I don't know what it is. But it was odd. I so wish that's I the first. Uh, dude, I wished everybody would have looked up and was like, what is, I would love to have more people tell me because I hope it's nothing more than a crane. Because I hope I didn't squander the opportunity that the one right. chance I had to seeing something really cool and here's my dumb ass sitting here like, I don't know what that is, just staring at it. Yeah. Well, if anyone else out there has seen something similar to Cam's, please email the show. Also, if you have any stories or sightings of any kind you'd like to share with me and Cam, email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can follow me and Cam on all forms of social media. Uh, coming up on Expanded Perspectives Elite, I'm going to be talking about some more Glimmer Man sightings. What? what? We've had more people uh, email the show uh, with sightings of the, the Glimmer Man, so mm -hmm. I'm going to be getting into that. Uh, if you want to listen to Expanded Perspectives Elite, you have to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com, click on the Elite tab, and uh, signing up is easy. It's $5 a month. You'll get extra elite shows every month, as well as access to our entire back catalog. I believe that's 219 or so shows, full length shows, the same length as expanded perspectives. If you like expanded perspectives, you're going to like expanded perspectives elite. Uh, it's the same thing as the regular show. Just they're hidden except uh, for subscribers only. Um, Cam, what else uh, you got planned for the week? I'm just going to work hard, put my nose to the grindstone, Went and shot a little archery over the weekend. I'm going to do some more archery shooting. Got to go do some more grappling. Got to try to stay in shape. Hey, glad you're back, man. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah, I'm feeling much better. Uh, I got to continue to do my exercises. I got to get back to work as well as some boring continuing education. Oh, uh, you bring that up. I forgot. I got to do that too. For all you elite oh. members, uh, I'll be talking to you soon or we'll be talking to you soon. For everybody else, till next week, I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.